Hey folks, welcome back to the video lectures for unit one. So today we're talking about the methods of philosophy. This unit is all about how to do the things in this class that you're going to need to do, how to study the material, how to approach the subject matter, and how we're gonna actually do the kinds of discussions and details of things that we're gonna be doing. So this lecture is all about building what I like to call a philosopher's toolkit to a certain extent. Like before we actually get into the, any of the various areas, or start talking about the different problems that we talk about. I want to effectively give you a set of tools that you can use to better understand the readings and to better approach the kind of topics that we deal with. So honestly, this lecture is probably one of the more dry ones that we do out of the semester. It's vocab heavy. and We don't get to bring up any, well, at least not many interesting questions or fascinating discussion starters or any big moral problems just yet. But if you bear with me through this kind of thing, I guarantee it'll help you be able to approach this same subject matter later on in the semester. So since we're dealing with the kinds of fundamental problems that we talked about in the last lecture, we can't really use experiments in the same way that a scientist would to approach these same problems. Like if we're approaching something like environmental ethics, we can do experiments to see what the impacts of certain actual actions are. We can look at things like, oh, if we use this pesticide, it'll have this sort of impact on environments or on uh, the plant and animal life in a region. We can talk about the effects on people. But all of these things are purely descriptive. They don't say anything whatsoever about the value, about the goodness or badness of the action. They just tell us what the action does. Our job is actually to evaluate the ethics and the morality of those kinds of problems. So just looking at the actual cause and effect isn't quite enough. So we can't just use material and natural experiments to identify the kinds of things that we as philosophers investigate. And that's true for almost every area of philosophy. If we want to dig into things like uh, what is knowledge, we can't just go around and survey people about that sort of thing. Even social science methods don't work for us very well. Because all that sort of stuff does is it tells us what people think about a problem rather than what's actually true about this particular subject or about this particular question. So philosophy in general doesn't usually use experiments to try and figure out its questions. Instead, philosophers use reason to clarify and evaluate ideas and to compare various theories and see which ones are best. And this is where you get your stereotypes of what philosophers are actually like. And you get the idea of a bearded old white guy sitting around and asking odd questions or having long conversations or stoned undergrads chatting at 2 a.m. about life, death and the meaning of things. And honestly, to a certain extent, all of those are true. Uh, generally, the last bit, maybe not so much for some people. But overall, the methods that that sort of image implies are the ones that philosophers use. Philosophers work with fundamental ideas. They work with fundamental principles. And these are things that don't have very obvious examples in the world all the time. They affect the world. You know, these assumptions and concepts and ideas inform the way that we relate to things. But on their own, we can't find them and poke them with a stick or run it through a centrifuge or a mass spectrometer or whatever else. So instead, we have to have ways of evaluating, comparing the different ideas that people come up with and see how well they work and how they fit together. And so that sort of process involves clarifying definitions, ruling out bad theories, finding mistakes. Essentially, it's like a process of elimination with a very, very rigorous standard where different people propose different ideas about a subject. And then we take those proposals and we compare them, we clarify them, we define them, and we see whether or not they actually fit together with the rest of what we know and whether or not we can rationally believe in them. Of course, anybody can believe anything. You can get a crazy person to believe that the sky is green on a given day. But that doesn't mean that there's reason to do so. So when we talk about the methods of philosophy, when we talk about the kind of stuff that we do in this lecture, we're looking at what sort of standards and tools should we be using to evaluate ideas? What are the various tools that we can use to compare and see whether or not an idea or a proposal or a theory is actually somewhat decent. And so to that end, most of what we do in here is done by making arguments for, for various positions. 
And by arguments, I'm not talking about the kind of thing that you, know, you and a significant other or your parents or you and a friend might have. I'm not talking about the shouting match where a couple of different people try and you know, see which one of you is right in that extent. When we talk about an argument, we're talking simply about a statement or an idea that we'll call the thesis or the conclusion of an argument that's supported by reasons. It's a set of statements, some of which support the other one being true. The example that's used in every philosophy class on the planet is this one. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. This is an argument. Just like politicians have, just like scientists have, just like anyone involved in business has. Anytime you're trying to convince someone of something, one of the options you have available to you is to make arguments, to give reasons in support of that position. You can do other things. You can you know, try and bribe them into believing you. You can you know, make them feel bad for you. You can make them feel certain emotions or whatever. It's all the pathos, ethos sort of stuff that you deal with in comm classes and whatever else. But one of your main tools is to give reasons, just like this argument gives a pair of reasons that Socrates is immortal, that Socrates will die. And so, yeah, this is a standard, simple example of an argument. We have a couple of different parts. I have numbered the various statements here so we can refer to them easily. Whenever I talk about an argument being a standard format or a line-by-line -line format, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So here, statements one and two are reasons for thinking that Socrates is immortal. That is, one and two are reasons why three is true. And so, for one, again, this is what makes it an argument. So one person can have an argument entirely on their own if you sit in an empty room by yourself and come up with reasons for a given statement. But these reasons... As part of an argument, we can refer to as, a, as the premises of an argument, or the individual premise would be, you know, like uh, statement one, all men are mortal, is a premise in this argument. It's a reason or a bit of evidence that somebody is giving in support of that conclusion. And the conclusion is the thing that an argument is trying to convince you of. The conclusion is what someone's trying to demonstrate to you by giving reasons for that position. Now, here's the reason why we actually have you know, this sort of detail, why I'm telling you this sort of stuff. None of this is probably all that mind-blowing. It's probably rather straightforward. You're just getting the vocabulary down. But having this kind of vocabulary and knowing this kind of format is actually a really useful thing for digging into philosophical questions. You see, if we can identify the conclusion of the thesis somebody is arguing for, then we have a far better idea of you know, how rational that sort of position is or what kind of evidence is needed to support it. People make arguments all the time. In fact, in a lot of ways, I'm doing it right now. I'm trying to convince you that this is useful stuff for doing philosophy. But usually people don't always come out and just say, I'm going to try and convince you of X. You get politicians, you get salesmen, you get people in every aspect of life who give arguments out in the real world that are nowhere near listed this clearly. If you can identify the premises and the conclusion and label them as such, we can do a far better job of actually analyzing that argument because now we can sort of pin it down in a lot of ways that we couldn't before. So a couple of other terms that we can use to try and pin down arguments to identify them and see what standards should and shouldn't be applied to them are these broad categories of arguments. Because people give all sorts of arguments for things. They give all sorts of reasons for the different positions that they hold. Some arguments try and give conclusive, rock-solid evidence for the conclusions. These arguments are set up so that if the reasons that somebody gives, if the premises of that argument are true, then the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. And these are things that we call deductive arguments, or deductive, if we're just talking casually. Other arguments only try and give some amount of support for the conclusion. They try and give you good reasons for thinking that conclusion is true, but they don't guarantee it. They're just trying to convince you in a more general sort of sense. And these we call inductive arguments. If this isn't clear yet, that's all right. We're going to spend a bit more time on it. Looking at uh, how we evaluate these things, though, 
uh, we want to be able to know if arguments are good or bad. That's rather the whole point of being able to pin things down in these ways. Like if somebody were to give you a set of reasons for saying that you're going to die one day, if you've never heard that idea before, if you're not familiar with that sort of concept of death, that's a rather shocking and large idea. You need to be able to see whether or not somebody is just pulling your chain or not. And so in addition to just identifying arguments or labeling them or sticking various uh, concepts on top of them, uh, we have specific terms that we can use to evaluate them. And some of these depend very much on the kind of argument that we're dealing with. Deductive arguments are ones that try and give conclusive, irrefutable proof for their conclusion. These things are set up like the Socrates argument, where so long as both one and two are true, number three must also be true. And so these arguments we talk about as being either valid or invalid. When we use these terms, again, like with the term argument, we're not saying something general. We're not using English in the same sort of casual or everyday sense that you or I do out on the street. Instead, we're trying to say something far more technical. We're trying to say whether or not the premises, those first initial reasons, guarantee that the conclusion must be true. To put it another way, an argument is valid in the technical sense that we care about. An argument's valid if the premises are true and the conclusion cannot be false at the same time. If we go back to our example here, uh, if we look at these three statements, if premises one and two are both true, if it's true that all men are mortal and it's true that Socrates is a man, it's impossible for Socrates to not also be mortal if both one and two are true. This is an example of what we call a valid argument. Another way of like describing this sort of thing is that it's truth preserving. So long as the reasons, the premises are true, it'll guarantee the truth of the conclusion. It's basically valid arguments are a process of preserving truth from evidence to conclusion, from premise to conclusion. Think about when you go to the doctor. When we talk about good doctors, you want somebody that you can tell all your symptoms to, and they'll actually give you a true diagnosis. Like if you went to a doctor and you said, oh, well, um, you know, I'm sneezing all the time. I've got this weird gunk coming out of my nose. I feel just icky and awful. My nose is running. I've got this cough. And then the doctor immediately says, oh, yeah, sounds like your leg's broken. That doesn't really make any sense. That doctor is not doing the doctor job. They're not, perform they're not practicing medicine well at all. They're not uh, taking what you are telling them and getting a true or accurate diagnosis. The process is messed up along the way. This is the same kind of thing we're looking at with valid arguments. Valid arguments are truth-preserving arguments. They're ones that if you have true evidence and reasons, if the premises and the argument's true, then you're going to have a true conclusion just as a uh, matter of logical fact. Now, similarly, if you can't get that kind of guarantee, then we say that an argument's invalid. We say that an argument is invalid if the premises can be true and the conclusion false. If it's possible to have those initial statements be true and the conclusion still turn out false in some way, you don't have a reliable argument. You don't have an argument whose structure lets you guarantee that the conclusion is true. Uh, we've got the Socrates argument again, uh, taking that test of validity and invalidity. Let's actually ask the questions down here. You know, I, I've sort of spoiled already that this is a valid argument since we went back and looked at it. But let's actually ask the question that we use to test for validity. So an argument is a set of reasons that support a conclusion. You know, that whole thing is called the argument. One and two are the premises, three is the conclusion. So we want to be able to test out an argument. Since this tries to guarantee that conclusion, it's not talking about there's good reason to think that Socrates is mortal. It's not saying that there's evidence to, that Socrates is mortal or that it's likely that Socrates is mortal. No, this is flat out trying to guarantee 
that Socrates is moral. The argument doesn't make it so, but it's giving evidence that that's the case. And it's trying to guarantee that conclusion by giving the kind of evidence that it does. So this is a deductive argument, which means that we're looking at validity and invalidity, valid or invalid, to evaluate it. So to test for validity, we actually ask, is it possible for one and two to be true and three be false in some way? And in this case, no. There's, there's no way that Socrates can be a man for it to also be true that all men, every single one of them, are mortal, and then Socrates be an exception to that rule. If three is false, then that means that one or two also has to be false somewhere. There's got to be a mistake made in that whole process. So we would say that this is a valid argument. Uh, take this one, another example. Some girls are blonde. Sophia is a girl. Therefore, Sophia is blonde. Is this valid? It's an argument. It gives reasons for the idea that Sophia is blonde. But hopefully you can see immediately that this doesn't guarantee the conclusion. Just the fact that Sophia is a girl doesn't guarantee that she's blonde. Nor does the fact that some girls are blonde guarantee that Sophia is a blonde. You know, a few of you may either you know, be non-blonde women, or you may know some, you may be related to some, but either way, I guarantee if you didn't know this fact before, there are non-blonde women out in the world. So the fact that some people are blonde has nothing to do with the fact that Sophia is. So despite this being the same kind of structure as the first one, this argument doesn't guarantee that its conclusion is true. So this is an invalid argument. It's possible for one and two to be true, because they, you know, let's say that they are. You know, Sophia is a random imaginary person, but let's say that she is, in fact, a girl. It's possible for one and two to be true and three still be false. It's possible for Sophia to be a brunette or a redhead, or maybe she shaved her head and had it laser removed so that she's nothing at all, if we're talking about hair color and all that. So in this case, it's possible for that conclusion to be false while the premises are still true. This is an invalid argument. But this isn't the only thing that we look for in arguments. When we try and evaluate these, there's more that can be said. Like, take, for example, another argument, another one in this line-by-line -line numbered format. My Subaru has four-wheel drive. If a car has four-wheel drive, then it can fly. Therefore, my Subaru can fly. Hopefully this sounds a little bit weird to you. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that this is actually a valid argument. If it's true that my Subaru has four-wheel drive, and if it's true that there's a link between four-wheel driving and flying, then that'll guarantee that my Subaru can fly. So long as one and two are true, then number three must also be true. There's no way to rationally believe that one and two are true and three is false. But none of these things are true, actually. For one, I don't drive a Subaru, and no cars can fly, as far as I know. You know, there's a couple of prototype things that are out there, but it's arguable whether or not they're even cars. And they're really just tiny planes that can take off and land vertically with larger wheels. But either way, the point is that a valid argument doesn't actually have to tell us anything about the world. It's still a kind of crappy argument in a lot of ways because it's talking about nonsense. And we can do this about any sort of characters or details that we want. We could build valid arguments about scientific facts, about the president, about whoever, whatever. And it doesn't actually guarantee that the conclusion is true. Put it another way, this argument's valid, but it's not sound. It doesn't have both a true conclusion and true premises. In this case, every line is false. Uh, to stress on this in a different way, valid arguments are ones whose structure guarantees that if big if, big pause, dramatic effect, if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. But validity on its own does not guarantee that they actually are true. They could be false, like in the case of the Subaru and the ability to fly. Instead, what we look for, what really constitutes a good 
argument in a lot of ways for this class is a sound argument. And again, this is a technical term that we're using. Uh, since it's bolded and underlined like some of the other terms that we've looked at, these are vocab words that we're using in specific ways that you probably ought to be familiar with. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So sound arguments, just simply by definition, are valid arguments that have both true premises and true conclusions. Now, with this definition, we can look back to the Socrates argument and say that not only is it valid, it's also sound. Uh, in this case, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. We've already talked about that if one and two are true, three must also be true. But it is true that one and two are true. It is true that all men are mortal. Sorry, gentlemen, but we are all going to die at some point. And it's also true that Socrates is a man, or more accurately, was a man. And it's also true that Socrates actually died. Socrates was a real person, died in ancient Greece. We'll talk about him in the future. But in this case, we have a valid argument that has true premises and a true conclusion. And so we can call this a sound argument. It's a good argument. It's a simple one. It doesn't tell us anything particularly informative. It's not perhaps all that useful, but it's a good argument in the ways that we care about. Now, I mentioned earlier in all of this that there are a couple of different kinds of arguments, deductive and inductive arguments. Deductive arguments try and guarantee their conclusions, and they're the ones that have validity and soundness applied to them. Inductive arguments are a little bit different. Inductive arguments are arguments that don't try to guarantee their conclusion. It's not a goal of an inductive argument to guarantee that the conclusion is true. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to criticize inductive arguments as being valid or invalid. You know, it's not a goal that an inductive argument is trying to accomplish. They're simply trying to give evidence or give some reasons in favor of their conclusion. They're still arguments. They still give reasons and evidence for their conclusions, but they don't try and guarantee it. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to criticize them for failing to do something they're not trying to do. Instead, we talk about inductive arguments as being either strong or weak, depending on how well those premises support the conclusion. Let's look at an inductive version of our past example with Socrates. All men that I've met are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is probably mortal. This is an inductive argument. If you look at the so-called indicator words, uh, like Socrates is probably mortal, that probably goes a long way towards identifying this as an inductive argument. It's not trying to guarantee the absolute truth that Socrates is mortal. Instead, it's merely giving evidence for it. It's simply saying that Socrates is probably mortal. It's saying that all the men I've met, all the ones that I've met in the past, which is a far more limited idea than the absolute truth that all men are mortal. So because of the kind of evidence that this is giving, the idea that every man that I've met is immortal, a mortal, not immortal. Um, because it's giving the evidence that all the men that I've met are mortal and saying that Socrates is probably mortal, this is an inductive argument, for one. So we can identify it through use of that kind of indicator term right here. But we can also say that this is a fairly strong argument. If you've never seen an exception to a particular rule, if you've never seen an immortal person, well, that's pretty good evidence that gentlemen were going to die. You know, that establishes a fairly strong link between the evidence given and the conclusion that we're trying to reach, that Socrates is mortal, that Socrates is probably mortal. Uh, these two facts make a strong link to number three, so we say that this is a strong argument. There's not necessarily particular bright line type definitions. There's not a set of... Uh, there's not a checklist we can go through and say that this is strong or weak, but we can usually get a fairly good sense of it, depending on how well that evidence connects up to the conclusion. Let's look at another one of these. Uh, Sophia was in the football stadium today. Someone scored a touchdown today. Therefore, Sophia scored a touchdown today. 
Now, let's assume that this is a game day, that there's actually a football game going on sometime today, depending on when you're watching this or... Uh, well, I know that there's not one going on right now, but depending on when you're watching this, there may actually be a football game going on. So let's assume that there is for the moment. You're just hypotheticals and all that. So assuming that there is some sort of a football game going on, uh, there's probably just simply the fact that Sophia is one of many thousands of people inside the stadium for the game. If we're talking a large college fo football game like at Purdue. And... If you have a large college football game going on, let's say that it's true that someone scored a touchdown today. So in other words, let's say that premises one and two are actually true. If that's the case, how good of evidence are one and two for three? So let's say that someone scored a touchdown in the football stadium. Sophia was in the football stadium, along with thousands of other people. Is that good evidence for the idea that Sophia is the one who actually scored the touchdown? Well, no. It could have been anybody. It could have been any one of the athletes. A random fan could have grabbed a ball and ran onto the field. We could have had a streaker steal it from the quarterback and perform a star touchdown. They'll be on the news tonight or something. You know, any number of various things could have happened. The mere fact that one and two are true doesn't give us very good evidence for three. And so this is a weak argument overall. It tries to give evidence for three. It's a set of reasons supporting a conclusion. They just do a really bad job of supporting that conclusion. And so overall, we'd say it's a weak argument. Now, some inductive arguments do do things a little bit differently, and they do deserve special mention since they're so common and so useful. And these are uh, arguments that try and fit the conclusion as best they can to the facts, even though there's no guarantee that it's correct. And this is something that's often called inference to the best explanation or abduction. It's the kind of thing that detectives on cop shows or in real life do. It's the kind of thing that Sherlock Holmes is actually most famous for uh, in the various stories and adaptations and whatever else. Uh, Sherlock Holmes talks about the power of deduction, but actually Sherlock Holmes is using the process called abduction where you take a set of facts and you try and uh, come up with the best explanation for those facts, which is an inductive argument. You can't guarantee that that conclusion is true, but you can try and form a strong link between the evidence and the conclusion. So let's suppose that our last example about football had a few more facts attached to it. Let's say Sophia was in the football stadium today. We know that someone scored a touchdown today. And let's say that we know that there was no one else besides Sophia near the end zone. Let's say that that area of the field was entirely devoid of people, fans, players, anyone. And we know that after the touchdown happened, Sophia was celebrating quite a lot. If that's the case, if one, two, three, and four are true, then that gives us a good amount of evidence that five is true, that Sophia actually was the one to score the touchdown. It's not guaranteed. Maybe a skydiver dropped out of the sky and did it. Maybe someone teleported in from the future or whatever else. These things don't necessarily change one, two, or three, one, two, three, or four, but both of those things are very unlikely. One of which is a matter of sci-fi and like probably actually impossible in a non-theoretical sense. Anyway, the point is, is that uh, in this case, we have a strong link between 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's not a guarantee that 5 is true, but it is, again, good evidence for it. So this is an inductive argument, but it's a particular one that we can refer to as an inference to the best explanation. And we'll refer to this sort of thing a few different times throughout the semester. So that's the basic vocabulary and classifications for arguments. Uh, we bring these up because having these terms, being able to identify these different things, is incredibly useful for the kind of stuff that we do. Uh, it allows us to label and work with various arguments. It allows us to label and work with the different perspectives on moral problems that we're going to deal with. And so having these sorts of tools is going to make us a lot better at our jobs of trying to figure out the different aspects of moral problems. But 
we have the issue of arguments in the wild often looking a lot different from the ones that we're looking at here. This uh, nice bracketed line-by-line -line format where we've numbered the premises, numbered the conclusion, we've got this nice line that sort of divides the premises and the conclusion. This sort of thing very rarely happens in the actual world. Uh, they're usually not bracketed off like this. Some philosophers do do this in their writings, but not all of them, and certainly not all of them that we're going to read. And it definitely doesn't happen out in the real world. So actual practice at finding and identifying these things in ordinary text or in conversations or in videos is actually invaluable in a lot of ways. So one of your assignments this unit, uh, your journal assignment, is to actually practice finding and identifying these kinds of things out in the wild, so to speak. So if you haven't done it already, take a look at that journal prompt to see what's being asked of you and to get a little bit of practice at identifying and finding these things out in the world. Doing so will make studying and working on the material this semester all the better for you. Uh, in the meantime, though, Hope you're having good luck with the semester so far.